For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Sheila Baradas. Today, we are with author, life coach, and motivational speaker, Frank Forst, to discuss his book, Beyond Burnout. Frank, you were the CEO of a subsidiary of a multinational company for more than 20 years. When did you realize that stress was affecting your leadership? I think it, uh, the defining moment was when I walked into the office and I thought I had it pretty much under control and I was actually showing some you know, positive leadership. I felt that some of my staff weren't pulling along and that you know, a certain distance was growing and I couldn't quite figure out why. Most importantly, is that over the years, a certain polarization uh, started between my staff, those that were really uh, very much uh, on board and were working hard and behind me and great colleagues, also at management team level. And then there were those that simply didn't want to pull up the socks and just didn't want to do what they were supposed to do. And of course, in a leadership position, that is extremely frustrating. And especially if you can't find out why that is, so you put it very quickly down to the quality of people that you've hired. But of course, over the years, that wasn't necessarily always the case. And as we know, okay, a rotten apple is a rotten apple. That, 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 is, that is very difficult to fix. But there were people, if I think back, that maybe if handled differently, could have made a better contribution. So I think that was the first uh, signal to see that something wasn't quite happening. What is the impact of prolonged high levels of stress on physical and mental health? Fatigue, irritability, uh, lack of cognitive ability. In other words, the boss starts to make decisions that might not be as well informed as they used to be. Um, the fact that the boss starts to maybe micromanage uh, and likes to do it himself. Uh, alienation, in other words, the office door gets closed or the boss is out of the office all the time. If we take stress a little bit further, uh, chronic stress, then burnout is around the corner. And I think burnout just emphasizes those traits. If I think about mental effects and taking chronic stress a little bit further, it impacts on our emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is about, you know, the ability to think about your emotions before you act on them. It is about making sure that in your interaction, A, with yourself, you have a, you know, a positive result. In other words, you think of yourself correctly, you have a normal uh, self-respect, self-awareness, uh, self-image. But most importantly, especially when it comes to leadership, is that you always seek a positive interaction with others regardless how negative the others might be towards you. And when it comes in particular to difficult uh, topics, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, when I think back of my negotiations with buyers that were on the verge of being unreasonable, that were emotional, that were, you know, pressing you, that were asking the impossible, it was with, with the with strength of emotional intelligence and negotiation skills, that one could come to a positive outcome. And a positive outcome, as you know, uh, Sheila, is a is a win-win, a win-win for both parties. Um, so that impact of chronic stress, the eating away of your emotional intelligence is extremely debilitating because it doesn't just affect your performance, but it affects your entire wellness, your the fact that you're a human being. And of course, this doesn't stop at the office this doesn't stop out there uh, with clients or uh, third parties. It affects your family life too. The recurring irritability of a boss or colleague is cited as a major cause of work stress. Why? The interesting part about uh, emotion, and as we know, irritability surely is, is an expression of, of a certain emotion, an emotion of frustration, uh, an emotion of subdued anger and emotion runs in what we call an open loop system if the boss walks into a boardroom and he's really in a foul mood what happens in the boardroom then is that suddenly your entire management team is starting to pick up the negative vibe which is then impacting on their ability to, to think creatively and to, you know, to, to think productively and then of course they start to give the kind of answers that, that are not productive and that might uh, upset uh, the structures even further. And then again, we, we're talking about a very negative uh, cycle. 
So the emotional loop is something we have to be really aware of. And I think if we take this to the home uh, environment, then you know we will know that if couple, a couple start to argue, there's only one that has to start uh, showing uh, an emotion of anger or frustration, which the other one, if again, emotional intelligence is not strongly present, will immediately pick up on, and that's how we can see an argument uh, building rapidly. So this is, this is particularly the danger with emotion. Actually. In your book, you say that dealing with stress is no longer a consideration in the modern world. It is now an essential life skill. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, I think that first and foremost, stress is a necessity. Stress is something that uh, creates, of course, emotion. And emotion is this what drives us as people. But too much stress, as in uh, distress, uh, unfortunately, it releases a constant stream of, of negative you know, of hormones, which in the short term, if they are released for the short while, are very uh, productive for, for our body and for the way that we act to certain situations. But chronic stress, where when these hormones are being secreted over a substantial period of time, then they start actually poisoning our bodies, causing things like autoimmune diseases. We know the people with, you know, with heart problems, uh, diabetes, and so forth. In other words, when our body is put in a constant state of stress, then unfortunately, we, we just can't seem to switch it off. In other words, stress starts to feed on stress and then it becomes a serious problem. Is there a correlation between stress and depression? Very much so. Sometimes people confuse depression uh, with stress, i.e. my depression is caused by stress or my stress is caused by my depression. Uh, I think that that is not quite the case, but then uh, again, I'm not a medical professional and I'm writing here and I'm, I'm commenting here from my own experiences. But there is no doubt that these hormones that are being secreted uh, in our stress response, the fact that they are wearing us down, the fact that they are diminishing our cognitive abilities, means also that, you know, to deal with our depression it becomes more and more difficult. The problem is that depression in the boardroom is a taboo. In other words, when you are a manager leading people, when you are a director, a CEO, you don't talk about the fact that you are depressed. That, of course, builds on itself. In other words, if, if people don't come forward and don't come out of that closet, then they will see that the, the, the condition deteriorate. And indeed, then we end up working either with difficult colleagues or difficult bosses. And the sad part of all this is, is that depression is something that can be treated and it can be managed as much as stress can be uh, managed uh, to a very large extent. And as long as people in important positions in particular are in denial, then of course this really starts to escalate. You speak a lot about emotional intelligence in your book. Can you explain to us what EQ is and how important it is in managing stress? EQ is uh, the skill on which we try and measure a person's ability to think about his emotions and, and control them and, and, and give an appropriate reaction. The EQ skill is, 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 uh, is a little bit subjective because it's, it, you can imagine that it's really difficult to mention or to measure different people's levels of emotions, but it gives an indication. I think that one of the big components of emotional intelligence is what we call resilience. And resilience means resilience in life. It's a bit like a tree that's planted, that is growing, and then the wind starts blowing. And if that tree isn't able to go with the wind, then there's a good chance that it will start breaking up. And, and this is what resilience is about. Resilience is one of the key components in emotional intelligence that says you can go with the flow, as it were. You can choose where you want to go with that flow, but you are open to suggestions. You are open to new information. 
you are willing to adapt. And again, this is an attribute of, of leaders in particular is that sometimes we have to accept changes in our environment. I think COVID is a very good example of where we come in when it comes to resilience. If we can't go with what COVID has brought on to us and the fact that we have changed to our lifestyles, we have to change the way that we work, then, then A, that will impact overall on our emotional intelligence, but, but then it creates a huge amount of stress. And then again, it becomes a vicious circle. Stress lowers your resilience, lower resilience can't protect you uh, against stress. So yes, th this is a very important component that you've just touched upon. How else can we all develop our emotional intelligence? I think it starts with self-reflection. If we don't know where we are in life, if we don't really have a good grasp of who we are, then, then the chance that we are being controlled by outside factors is, is, is rather large. I have likened this uh, as a, you know, the fact that we are our own portrait and our own painter. And nobody in life will eventually know what the final portrait will look like, but it is an ongoing process. And as we paint, you know, the, the portrait changes. But if we work with old material, then of course we will do damage to the portrait. If we work with material, that is not available, i.e. if we constantly think about the future and what might happen, then that doesn't do much for the portrait. So in other words, we have to be grounded in the presence. We work with the material that we have today. And even there, it is important that we know ourselves, know our shortcomings, know our strength, and that we focus on the latter, of course, this is pretty much well known. And for being grounded in the presence, we're talking about mindfulness. One of the, the biggest instruments to hold this vicious circle of stress uh, that builds upon itself is to A, be grounded today and be aware of what it is that you're doing. So mindfulness is, is, is really one of the first parts. The second one is also, well, also, it is logical, but for some or other reason, we as human beings find this really difficult. And then we talk about time and then we don't have time, but it's about healthy living. And healthy living is really about a healthy diet. And sure, we can have a, a good drink over the weekend and a good party and what have you, but we, we must really focus on, on what we eat and what we put into our bodies. And then it is really very important that we exercise. And what I'm telling you is not new, but if you're asking me what, what are very big weapons against stress, then this is very important. A, we live today. Sure, we plan about tomorrow because we need to find or know where we want to go to, but we can only do that if we have what we call a healthy body um, and, a, and, a, and a healthy mind that can only sit in a, in a healthy body. A lot of our stress is caused by time. And my biggest point in the book is, and this is what neuroscience shows us, that, that there's no point in freeing up time or trying to manage your time if A, you don't prioritize your time and stop procrastinating. I've written quite a bit about um, smart technology, smart communication, because as we know, you, it just interrupts our lives constantly. We even have withdrawal symptoms if we can't respond urgently. And they liken these symptoms of panic, of fear, anxiety, of not being at our phone quick enough or getting a negative uh, response on Facebook or whatever. They liken this to a similar uh, reaction that we have if we had withdrawal symptoms from cocaine. If we don't deal with this responsibly, then we just a waste time and b we don't give ourselves time for proper uninterrupted thinking can you expand on your statements that the brain's end goal is not to think at all and that the mind learns most when it is not in thought there's a, an american psychologist who is very very big on neuroscience and emotional intelligence his name is daniel goldman and i'm a very avid fan and follower um, 
But what he's saying is, uh, together with another man, uh, David Rock, is that indeed the brain is not gray, the brain is green. It doesn't want to waste energy. It is quite aware that it uses up, up to 20% of the body's energy every day, 25% in certain instances. The brain is concerned about the energy that it con consumes. So when information comes at us, impulses, anything from the outside, like we're having this conversation, is that it likes to process this information along the existing neural, uh, the neural connections between its brain cells. If it can use all those connections, then it will you know, deal with matters quickly and it can put it to bed and it can move on. That would be the first prize. And those neural connections are actually built as we have matured and as we have grown up. The big problem here, of course, is, is that my neural connections are not the same as yours. Everybody's neural connections are different. Now, the brain consumes a lot of energy when it has to build new pathways, when it has to build new connections. And that comes with information that it can't pass on to existing connections. And that's why if it has to think, then it, it prefers not to, where possible. If it has to build new connections, it will, but at a, at a cost, it's aware of it. But the problem with the brain is it either falls into habit, habitual thinking, and we're all very much aware of habit, or, and that is the biggest danger to us and in business, it wants to predict the outcome. In other words, it takes a little bit of information and says, well, if this is what it is, then this is what will happen. And it's the prediction stage where, as I said, the brain wants to do as little as possible. If this is the holy grail for the brain, if it can predict the situation, then of course it needs to do very little. And that is where in business in particular, we have to be so careful that we don't, what we call draw conclusions. And we haven't taken all the evidence that was presented to us. We only take the bits that we like, and the rest we discard and we then, you know, make a decision. How does a negative mindset affect those of others? Again, the, the negative mindset normally uh, uh, shows itself in negative utterances, in negative behavior, i.e. not being cooperative with colleagues, not making positive contributions when, when we are meeting, uh, not considering all the facts that might be available, being miserable, being in a, in a, in a so-called, say, bad mood. And again, all of this, the negative mindset, this allows its brain to consider all the information that's coming. B, by nature, it doesn't uh, evaluate this information ob objectively. And worse, uh, we come back to emotion, negative mindset, you could argue, is, is full of emotion. And that, of course, rub, rubs off on others. It becomes infectious. Are optimism and pessimism learned behaviors? I'm not a psychologist, so that is a very unfair question. <laughs> uh, I do think from, 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 from my experience and from what I've learned, that indeed they are learned behaviors, yes. That also means that they can be unlearned. And this is where hope comes in. This is where coaching comes in. This is where therapy can come in. And certain people have a negative mindset because it's linked to lower mood, to depression. And what happens with depression when it's untreated, it also really affects your cognitive thinking, you know, your frontal lobes. And, and when you just can't think, uh, properly, then then it's easy to to misinterpret information and and to you know to to be miserable. Optimism can be life changing. Can you explain what you mean by this? Optimism is a fundamental building block. Uh, it's one of the foundations, like resilience, as we mentioned earlier, of emotional intelligence that will help us to a interact positively with others, to interpret their comments towards us more positively as we would have done if we were constantly in a negative frame of mind. And yeah, we can talk about the cliche, the glass half full, the glass half empty. I like to think at times I see the glass and, and, you know, and, that is, <laughs> and that's a good start. Yeah. 
Um, you referred earlier to change and how our brains don't like um, deviating from that. Um, what is change management and why does it cause so much stress? It's something that, that is really at the forefront now of, of you know, MBA and leadership development and what have you. Change management, we never quite understood. We, we just thought there was a reticence among people just to, you know, to do things differently. Yes, we understand the reticence from the brain perspective because it has to work harder in processing information. And we must understand, Sheila, that the brain takes a relatively long time to follow a new direction because it takes time to build these neural connections, the new ones. But the other component that we've discovered about change management is, is that if not, if not explained and uh, accompanied and coached properly, a lot of people start to feel insecure because change means we are going somewhere where we haven't been before. That triggers an underlying anxiety with a lot of people. And it might not be an overt anxiety, but people start to become a little bit nervous. Leadership must accept the human factor and it must accept what neuroscience has proven all along is that, that really from a physical point of view, people need time to adjust. It is the hard skills that maybe are the easiest to change, but it is the rest of the human being of the employee that finds it difficult to come along. You dedicate a whole chapter in your book to coaching. Why is coaching so important and what are the benefits thereof? Coaching is about thinking forward. Coaching is something that takes you up into a new path and it explores your interests, your strengths, it awakens the passions that you've always had. In other words, coaching is very powerful in painting for you a new perspective on life that opens up your brain to new thinking and it actually encourages you to, to think, uh, but think differently. Most importantly with coaching then is, is to get you to do it. Because it's one thing about I want to become a pilot, but there are certain milestones along the way on how to become a pilot. And you also then need simply encouragement. You need a pat on the shoulder, a push in the back, and you need to have somebody who celebrates small victories with you. And you need somebody who, when you do fall down and you didn't just make that milestone, is to say, to pick you up. And in that process, you, you do go forward and your mind starts to change its thinking. And as you earlier talked about pessimists, pessimistic and being optimistic, I think, Coaching then can be a great driver in driving you from that inherent negativity, because the whole world has told you you're worthless, to positivity and say, look what you've achieved, look what we're going to do, look what you can do and see what you've already achieved in the process. Uh, companies are being coached, organizations are being coached more and more, management teams are being coached. Uh, and again, it's to, to really bring out your thinking, to be positive and allow yourself to be open to new perspectives. It was actually coaching and, and my friends who pulled me through coaching that I picked up this incredible interest uh, for neuroscience and for the fact that there was this incredible link between stress, emotional intelligence and behavior. What, in your opinion, makes a good leader? A good leader is, is somebody who brings the best out of other people. You have to have a, a high level of emotional intelligence. A good leader is one that remains the optimist in the darkest of times. A good leader is one who keeps perspective uh, and is open to new ideas. A good leader is resilient. Uh, but again, I have to come back to that. A good leader brings out the best of himself. It is, I learned a, a very important lesson in life that they said that if you are a managing director or a CEO or whatever, and you have to bring together a management team, then you must bring in people that are better than you in certain areas. All the areas where you are weak, you please, you know, you must get people that, that are strong and you mustn't feel threatened. Uh, in other words, that they can, uh, 
you know, also help you uh, in, in growth. It's really important that you get a management team that can disagree with you, a management team that can stand up and voice their opinions so that you can learn and you can open up to, to all of this. But being a leader in life, uh, being a good husband, a good mother, a good partner, whatever is really about bringing the best out in others and, 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 and making them achieve what they should be achieving. What would you say are the biggest challenges to leadership and leading a company right now? If anything, today, leaders have a huge challenge in, in looking at the human aspect of their workforce. It is now the time where, you know, where COVID allows us at least to, you know, interact human, is to interact and, and to, to be the face and to, to be a source of inspiration. It is now for every leader of key importance that we look after our health, that we don't, that, you know, that we see the stresses, that we see the signs of stress coming because they will be coming regardless of who you are. And, and that we really are fully conscious of, of, of what is happening. This is a very challenging word for, for any leader. And if anything, just coming back to, you know, tools and, and, and other things, we know about healthy body, healthy mind, and we know about wellness, we know about practicing mindfulness, but this is the time for, for a leader to really pay attention to these practices. That was Frank Foss speaking about his new book, Beyond Burnout.